Anti-Semitism, Wikipedia article audio Anti-Semitism is hostility to, prejudice, or discrimination against Jews. A person who holds such positions is called an anti-Semite. Anti-Semitism is generally considered to be a form of racism. Anti-Semitism may be manifested in many ways, ranging from expressions of hatred of or discrimination against individual Jews to organized pogroms by mobs, state police, or even military attacks on entire Jewish communities. Although the term did not come into common usage until the 19th century, it is now also applied to historic anti-Jewish incidents. Notable instances of persecution include the Rhineland massacres preceding the First Crusade in 1096, the Edict of Expulsion from England in 1290, the massacres of Spanish Jews in 1391, the persecutions of the Spanish Inquisition, the expulsion from Spain in 1492, the Cossack massacres in Ukraine from 1648 to 1657, various anti-Jewish pogroms in the Russian Empire between 1821 and 1906, the 1894-1906 Dreyfus Affair in France, the Holocaust in German-occupied Europe, official Soviet anti-Jewish policies, and Arab and Muslim involvement in the Jewish exodus from Arab and Muslim countries. Origin and usage in the context of xenophobia Etymology The root word Semite gives the false impression that anti-Semitism is directed against all Semitic people, e.g., including Arabs and Assyrians. The compound word anti-Semite was popularized in Germany in 1879 as a scientific-sounding term for Juden Hass, and that has been its common use since then. The origin of anti-Semitic terminologies is found in the responses of Moritz Steinschneider to the views of Ernest Renat. As Alex Bain writes, the compound anti-Semitism appears to have been used first by Steinschneider who challenged Renat on account of his anti-Semitic prejudices. Avner Fox similarly writes, the German word antisemitisch was first used in 1860 by the Austrian Jewish scholar Moritz Steinschneider in the phrase antisemitisk vorer Thiel. Steinschneider used this phrase to characterize the French philosopher Ernest Renat's false ideas about how Semitic races were inferior to Aryan races. Pseudoscientific theories concerning race, civilization, and progress had become quite widespread in Europe in the second half of the 19th century, especially as Prussian nationalistic historian Heinrich von Treitschke did much to promote this form of racism. He coined the phrase the Jews are our misfortune which would later be widely used by Nazis. According to Avner Falk, Treitschke uses the term Semitic almost synonymously with Jewish, in contrast to Renat's use of it to refer to a whole range of peoples, based generally on linguistic criteria. According to Jonathan M. Hess, the term was originally used by its authors to stress the radical difference between their own anti-Semitism and earlier forms of antagonism toward Jews and Judaism. In 1879 German journalist Wilhelm Marr published a pamphlet, Der Sieg des Judenthums über das Germanenthum. Vom nicht confessionellen Standpunkt aus betrachtet in which he used the word Semitismus interchangeably with the word Judentum to denote both Jewry and Jewishness. Usage This use of Semitismus was followed by a coining of Antisemitismus which was used to indicate opposition to the Jews as a people and opposition to the Jewish spirit, which Marr interpreted as infiltrating German culture. His next pamphlet, Der Wegzum Siege der Germanenthums über das Judenthum, 
presents a development of Mayer's ideas further and may present the first published use of the German word antisemitismus, antisemitism. The pamphlet became very popular, and in the same year he founded the Antisemiten Liga, apparently named to follow the anti kanzler Liga. The League was the first German organization committed specifically to combating the alleged threat to Germany and German culture posed by the Jews and their influence, and advocating their forced removal from the country. Definition So far as can be ascertained, the word was first widely printed in 1881, when Marr published Zwang Glo's Antisemitisk Heft and Wilhelm Scherer used the term antisemitin in the January issue of Neue Frey Press. The Jewish Encyclopedia reports, in February 1881, a correspondent of the Allgemeine Zeitung des Judentums speaks of antisemitism as a designation which recently came into use. On July 19, 1882, the editor says, this quite recent anti-Semitism is hardly three years old. The related term philo-Semitism was coined around 1885. Evolution of Usage From the outset the term anti-Semitism bore special racial connotations and meant specifically prejudice against Jews. The term is confusing for in modern usage Semitic designates a language group, not a race. In this sense, the term is a misnomer, since there are many speakers of Semitic languages who are not the objects of anti-Semitic prejudices, while there are many Jews who do not speak Hebrew, a Semitic language. Though anti-Semitism has been used to describe prejudice against people who speak other Semitic languages, the validity of such usage has been questioned. Manifestations The term may be spelled with or without a hyphen. Some scholars favor the unhyphenated form because, if you use the hyphenated form, you consider the words Semitism, Semite, Semitic as meaningful whereas in anti-Semitic parlance, Semites really stands for Jews, just that. For example, Emil Fackenheim supported the unhyphenated spelling, in order to the notion that there is an entity Semitism which anti-Semitism opposes. Others endorsing an unhyphenated term for the same reason include Padre Hare, Professor of Religious and Theological Studies and Director of the Center for the Study of Jewish-Christian-Muslim Relations at Merrimack College, Yehuda Bauer. Professor of Holocaust Studies at the Avraham Harman Institute of Contemporary Jewry at Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and James Carroll, historian and novelist. According to Carroll, who first cites O'Hare and Bauer on the existence of something called Semitism, the hyphenated word thus reflects the bipolarity that is at the heart of the problem of anti Semitism. Cultural Anti Semitism Objections to the usage of the term, such as the obsolete nature of the term Semitic as a racial term, have been raised since at least the 1930s. Though the general definition of anti-Semitism is hostility or prejudice against Jews, and, according to Olaf Blaschke, has become an umbrella term for negative stereotypes about Jews, a number of authorities have developed more formal definitions. Religious anti-Semitism Holocaust scholar and City University of New York professor Helen Fien defines it as a persisting latent structure of hostile beliefs towards Jews as a collective manifested in individuals as attitudes, and in culture as myth, ideology, folklore, and imagery and in actions social or legal discrimination, political mobilization against the Jews, and collective or state violence which results in and slash or is designed to distance, displace, or destroy Jews as Jews. Elaborating on Fine's definition, Dietz Baring of the University of Cologne writes that, 
to anti-Semites, Jews are not only partially but totally bad by nature, that is, their bad traits are incorrigible. Because of this bad nature, Jews have to be seen not as individuals but as a collective. Jews remain essentially alien in the surrounding societies. Jews bring disaster on their host societies or on the whole world, they are doing it secretly, therefore the anti-Semites feel obliged to unmask the conspiratorial, bad Jewish character. For Sonia Weinberg, as distinct from economic and religious anti-Judaism, anti-Semitism in its modern form shows conceptual innovation, a resort to science to defend itself new functional forms and organizational differences. It was anti-liberal, racialist and nationalist. It promoted the myth that Jews conspired to Judas the world, it served to consolidate social identity, it channeled dissatisfactions among victims of the capitalist system, and it was used as a conservative cultural code to fight emancipation and liberalism. Bernard Lewis defines anti-Semitism as a special case of prejudice, hatred, or persecution directed against people who are in some way different from the rest. According to Lewis, anti-Semitism is marked by two distinct features, Jews are judged according to a standard different from that applied to others, and they are accused of cosmic evil. Thus, it is perfectly possible to hate and even to persecute Jews without necessarily being anti-Semitic unless this hatred or persecution displays one of the two features specific to anti-Semitism. There have been a number of efforts by international and governmental bodies to define anti-Semitism formally. The United States Department of State states that while there is no universally accepted definition, there is a generally clear understanding of what the term encompasses. For the purposes of its 2005 report on global anti-Semitism, the term was considered to mean hatred toward Jews individually and as a group that can be attributed to the Jewish religion and slash or ethnicity. Economic Anti-Semitism In 2005, the European Monitoring Centre on Racism and Xenophobia, then an agency of the European Union, developed a more detailed working definition, which states, anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews, which may be expressed as hatred toward Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and slash or their property toward Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. It also adds that such manifestations could also target the State of Israel, conceived as a Jewish collectivity, but that criticism of Israel similar to that leveled against any other country cannot be regarded as anti-Semitic. It provides contemporary examples of ways in which anti-Semitism may manifest itself, including promoting the harming of Jews in the name of an ideology or religion, promoting negative stereotypes of Jews, holding Jews collectively responsible for the actions of an individual Jewish person or group, denying the Holocaust or accusing Jews or Israel of exaggerating it, and accusing Jews of dual loyalty or a greater allegiance to Israel than their own country. It also lists ways in which attacking Israel could be anti-Semitic, and states that denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination, e.g. by claiming that the existence of a state of Israel is a racist endeavor, can be a manifestation of anti-Semitism as can applying double standards by requiring of Israel a behavior not expected or demanded of any other democratic nation or holding Jews collectively responsible for the actions of the State of Israel. Late in 2013, the definition was removed from the website of the Fundamental Rights Agency. A spokesperson said that it had never been regarded as official and that the agency did not intend to develop its own definition. However, 
despite its disappearance from the website of the Fundamental Rights Agency, the definition has gained widespread international use. The definition has been adopted by the European Parliament Working Group on Antisemitism, in 2010 it was adopted by the United States Department of State, in 2014 it was adopted in the Operational Hate Crime Guidance of the UK College of Policing and was also adopted by the Campaign Against Antisemitism, and in 2016 it was adopted by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, making it the most widely adopted definition of antisemitism around the world. Racial Antisemitism In 1879, Wilhelm Marr founded the Antisemitan Liga. Identification with antisemitism and as an antisemite was politically advantageous in Europe during the late 19th century. For example, Karl Luiger, the popular mayor of Fin de Siecle Vienna, skillfully exploited antisemitism as a way of channeling public discontent to his political advantage. In its 1910 obituary of Luiger, the New York Times notes that Luiger was chairman of the Christian Social Union of the Parliament and of the Anti-Semitic Union of the Diet of Lower Austria. In 1895 A.C. Cusa organized the Alliance Anti-Semitici Universelle in Bucharest. In the period before World War II, when animosity towards Jews was far more commonplace, it was not uncommon for a person, an organization, or a political party to self-identify as an anti-Semite or anti-Semitic. Political and Economic Antisemitism, giving as examples Cicero and Charles Lindbergh, Theological or Religious Antisemitism, sometimes known as Anti-Judaism, nationalistic anti-Semitism, citing Voltaire and other Enlightenment thinkers, who attacked Jews for supposedly having certain characteristics, such as greed and arrogance, and for observing customs such as Kashrut and Shabbat, and racial anti-Semitism, with its extreme form resulting in the Holocaust by the Nazis. In 1882, the early Zionist pioneer Judah Leib Pinsker wrote that anti-Semitism was a psychological response rooted in fear and was an inherited predisposition. He named the condition Judeophobia. Judeophobia is a variety of demonopathy with the distinction that it is not peculiar to particular races but is common to the whole of mankind. Judeophobia is a psychic aberration. As a psychic aberration it is hereditary, and as a disease transmitted for 2,000 years it is incurable. In this way have Judaism and anti-Semitism passed for centuries through history as inseparable companions, having analyzed Judeophobia as an hereditary form of demonopathy, peculiar to the human race, and having represented anti-Semitism as proceeding from an inherited aberration of the human mind we must draw the important conclusion that we must give up contending against these hostile impulses as we must against every other inherited predisposition. Religious, economic, social, racist, ideological, cultural In the aftermath of the Kristallnacht pogrom in 1938, German propaganda minister Goebbels announced, the German people is anti-Semitic. It has no desire to have its rights restricted or to be provoked in the future by parasites of the Jewish race. Political Anti-Semitism Conspiracy Theories New Anti-Semitism Indology After the 1945 victory of the Allies over Nazi Germany, and particularly after the full extent of the Nazi genocide against the Jews became known, the term anti-Semitism acquired pejorative connotations. This marked a full circle shift in usage, from an era just decades earlier when Jew was used as a pejorative term. Yehuda Bauer wrote in 1984, 
there are no anti-Semites in the world. Nobody says, I am anti-Semitic. You cannot, after Hitler. The word has gone out of fashion. Anti-Semitism manifests itself in a variety of ways. René Koenig mentions social anti-Semitism, economic anti-Semitism, religious anti-Semitism, and political anti-Semitism as examples. Koenig points out that these different forms demonstrate that the origins of anti-Semitic prejudices are rooted in different historical periods. Koenig asserts that differences in the chronology of different anti-Semitic prejudices and the irregular distribution of such prejudices over different segments of the population create serious difficulties in the definition of the different kinds of anti-Semitism. These difficulties may contribute to the existence of different taxonomies that have been developed to categorize the forms of anti-Semitism. The forms identified are substantially the same, it is primarily the number of forms and their definitions that differ. Bernard Lazare identifies three forms of anti-Semitism, Christian anti-Semitism, economic anti-Semitism, and ethnologic anti-Semitism. William Brustein names four categories, religious, racial, economic, and political. The Roman Catholic historian Edward Flannery distinguished four varieties of anti-Semitism. Louis Harap separates economic anti-Semitism and merges political and nationalistic anti-Semitism into ideological anti-Semitism. Harap also adds a category of social anti-Semitism. Gustavo Perdnick has argued that what he terms Judeophobia has a number of unique traits which set it apart from other forms of racism, including permanence, depth, obsessiveness, irrationality, endurance, ubiquity, and danger. He also wrote in his book The Judeophobia that the Jews were accused by the nationalists of being the creators of communism, by the communists of ruling capitalism. If they live in non-Jewish countries, they are accused of double loyalties, if they live in the Jewish country, of being racists. When they spend their money, they are reproached for being ostentatious, when they don't spend their money, of being avaricious. They are called rootless cosmopolitans or hardened chauvinists. If they assimilate, they are accused of being fifth columnists if they don't, of shutting themselves away. Louis Harap defines cultural anti-Semitism as that species of anti-Semitism that charges the Jews with corrupting a given culture and attempting to supplant or succeeding in supplanting the preferred culture with a uniform, crude, Jewish culture. Similarly, Eric Kandel characterizes cultural anti-Semitism as being based on the idea of Jewishness as a religious or cultural tradition that is acquired through learning, through distinctive traditions and education. According to Kandel, this form of anti-Semitism views Jews as possessing unattractive psychological and social characteristics that are acquired through acculturation. Newick and Nicosia characterize cultural anti-Semitism as focusing on and condemning the Jews' aloofness from the societies in which they live. An important feature of cultural anti-Semitism is that it considers the negative attributes of Judaism to be redeemable by education or by religious conversion. Religious anti-Semitism, also known as anti-Judaism, is antipathy towards Jews because of their perceived religious beliefs. In theory, anti-Semitism and attacks against individual Jews would stop if Jews stopped practicing Judaism or changed their public faith, especially by conversion to the official or right religion. However, in some cases discrimination continues after conversion, as in the case of Christianized Muranos or Iberian Jews in the late 15th century and 16th century who were suspected of secretly practicing Judaism or Jewish customs. Although the origins of anti-Semitism are rooted in the Judeo-Christian conflict, 
other forms of anti-Semitism have developed in modern times. Frederick Schweitzer asserts that, most scholars ignore the Christian foundation on which the modern anti-Semitic edifice rests and invoke political anti-Semitism, cultural anti-Semitism, racism or racial anti-Semitism, economic anti-Semitism and the like. William Nichols draws a distinction between religious anti-Semitism and modern anti-Semitism based on racial or ethnic grounds, the dividing line was the possibility of effective conversion, a Jew ceased to be a Jew upon baptism. From the perspective of racial anti-Semitism, however, the assimilated Jew was still a Jew, even after baptism. From the Enlightenment onward, it is no longer possible to draw clear lines of distinction between religious and racial forms of hostility towards Jews. Once Jews have been emancipated and secular thinking makes its appearance, without leaving behind the old Christian hostility towards Jews, the new term anti-Semitism becomes almost unavoidable, even before explicitly racist doctrines appear. History the underlying premise of economic anti-Semitism is that Jews perform harmful economic activities or that economic activities become harmful when they are performed by Jews. Linking Jews and money underpins the most damaging and lasting anti-Semitic canards. Anti-Semites claim that Jews control the world finances, a theory promoted in the fraudulent protocols of the elders of Zion and later repeated by Henry Ford and his Dearborn Independent. In the modern era, such myths continue to be spread in books such as The Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews published by the Nation of Islam, and on the Internet. Derek Pensler writes that there are two components to the financial canards. Abraham Foxman describes six facets of the financial canards. Ancient World Persecutions during the Middle Ages 17th Century Gerald Griffiths summarizes the myth as control the banks, the money supply, the economy and businesses of the community, of the country, of the world. Griffiths gives, as illustrations, Many slurs and proverbs which suggest that Jews are stingy, or greedy, or miserly, or aggressive bargainers. During the 19th century, Jews were described as scurrilous, stupid, and tight-fisted, but after the Jewish emancipation and the rise of Jews to the middle or upper class in Europe were portrayed as clever, devious, and manipulative financiers out to dominate. Leon Polyakov asserts that economic anti-Semitism is not a distinct form of anti-Semitism, but merely a manifestation of theologic anti-Semitism. In opposition to this view, Derek Pensla contends that in the modern era, the economic anti-Semitism is distinct and nearly constant but theological anti-Semitism is often subdued. An academic study by Francesco Diaconto, Marcel Prokochuk, and Michael Weber showed that people who live in areas of Germany that contain the most brutal history of anti-Semitic persecution are more likely to be distrustful of finance in general. Therefore, they tended to invest less money in the stock market and make poor financial decisions. The study concluded that the persecution of minorities reduces not only the long-term wealth of the persecuted, but of the persecutors as well. Racial anti-Semitism is prejudice against Jews as a racial-slash-ethnic group, rather than Judaism as a religion. Racial anti-Semitism is the idea that the Jews are a distinct and inferior race compared to their host nations. In the late 19th century and early 20th century, it gained mainstream acceptance as part of the eugenics movement, which categorized non-Europeans as inferior. It more specifically claimed that Northern Europeans, or Aryans, were superior. 
Racial anti-Semites saw the Jews as part of a Semitic race and emphasized their non-European origins and culture. They saw Jews as beyond redemption even if they converted to the majority religion. Enlightenment Racial anti-Semitism replaced the hatred of Judaism with the hatred of Jews as a group. In the context of the Industrial Revolution, following the Jewish emancipation, Jews rapidly urbanized and experienced a period of greater social mobility. With the decreasing role of religion in public life tempering religious anti-Semitism, a combination of growing nationalism, the rise of eugenics, and resentment at the socio-economic success of the Jews led to the newer, and more virulent, racist anti-Semitism. According to William Nichols, religious anti-Semitism may be distinguished from modern anti-Semitism based on racial or ethnic grounds. The dividing line was the possibility of effective conversion, a Jew ceased to be a Jew upon baptism. However, with racial anti-Semitism, now the assimilated Jew was still a Jew, even after baptism. From the Enlightenment onward, it is no longer possible to draw clear lines of distinction between religious and racial forms of hostility towards Jews. Once Jews have been emancipated and secular thinking makes its appearance, without leaving behind the old Christian hostility towards Jews, the new term anti-Semitism becomes almost unavoidable, even before explicitly racist doctrines appear. In the early 19th century, a number of laws enabling emancipation of the Jews were enacted in Western European countries. The old laws restricting them to ghettos, as well as the many laws that limited their property rights, rights of worship and occupation, were rescinded. Despite this, traditional discrimination and hostility to Jews on religious grounds persisted and was supplemented by racial anti-Semitism encouraged by the work of racial theorists such as Joseph Arthur de Gobineau and particularly his essay on the inequality of the human race of 1853-5. Nationalist agendas based on ethnicity, known as ethnonationalism, usually excluded the Jews from the national community as an alien race. Allied to this were theories of social Darwinism which stressed a putative conflict between higher and lower races of human beings. Such theories, usually posited by Northern Europeans, advocated the superiority of white Aryans to Semitic Jews. William Brustein defines political anti-Semitism as hostility toward Jews based on the belief that Jews seek national and slash or world power. Yisrael Gutman characterizes political anti-Semitism as tending to lay responsibility on the Jews for defeats and political economic crises while seeking to exploit opposition and resistance to Jewish influence as elements in political party platforms. According to Victor Carity, political anti-Semitism became widespread after the legal emancipation of the Jews and sought to reverse some of the consequences of that emancipation. Holocaust denial and Jewish conspiracy theories are also considered forms of anti-Semitism. Zoological conspiracy theories have been propagated by the Arab media and Arabic language websites alleging a Zionist plot behind the use of animals to attack civilians or to conduct espionage. Starting in the 1990s, some scholars have advanced the concept of new anti-Semitism, coming simultaneously from the left, the right, and radical Islam, which tends to focus on opposition to the creation of a Jewish homeland in the state of Israel and they argue that the language of anti-Zionism and criticism of Israel are used to attack Jews more broadly. In this view, the proponents of the new concept believe that criticisms of Israel and Zionism are often disproportionate in degree and unique in kind, and they attribute this to anti-Semitism.
Jewish scholar Gustavo Perdnik has posited that anti-Zionism in itself represents a form of discrimination against Jews, in that it singles out Jewish national aspirations as an illegitimate and racist endeavor, and proposes actions that would result in the death of millions of Jews. It is asserted that the new anti-Semitism deploys traditional anti-Semitic motifs, including older motifs such as the blood libel. Critics of the concept view it as trivializing the meaning of anti-Semitism, and as exploiting anti-Semitism in order to silence debate and to deflect attention from legitimate criticism of the State of Israel, and, by associating anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism, misused to taint anyone opposed to Israeli actions and policies. German Indologists arbitrarily identified layers in the Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita with the objective of fueling European anti-Semitism via the Indo-Aryan migration theory. This identification required equating Brahmins with Jews, resulting in anti-Brahminism. Many authors see the roots of modern anti-Semitism in both pagan antiquity and early Christianity. Jerome Chans identifies six stages in the historical development of anti-Semitism. Imperial Russia Voltaire Chans suggests that these six stages could be merged into three categories, ancient anti-Semitism, which was primarily ethnic in nature, Christian anti-Semitism, which was religious, and the racial anti-Semitism of the 19th and 20th centuries. The first clear examples of anti-Jewish sentiment can be traced to the 3rd century BCE to Alexandria, the home to the largest Jewish diaspora community in the world at the time and where the Septuagint, a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, was produced. Manetho, an Egyptian priest and historian of that era, wrote scathingly of the Jews. His themes are repeated in the works of Cheriman, Lysimachus, Posiodonius, Apollonius Molon, and in Apian and Tacitus. Agatharchides of Nidus ridiculed the practices of the Jews and the absurdity of their law, making a mocking reference to how Ptolemy Lagus was able to invade Jerusalem in 320 BCE because its inhabitants were observing the Shabbat. One of the earliest anti-Jewish edicts, promulgated by Antiochus IV Epiphanes in about 170-167 BCE, sparked a revolt of the Maccabees in Judea, 238. Islamic Anti-Semitism in the 19th Century In view of Manetho's anti-Jewish writings, Anti-Semitism may have originated in Egypt and been spread by the Greek retelling of ancient Egyptian prejudices. The ancient Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria describes an attack on Jews in Alexandria in 38 CE in which thousands of Jews died. The violence in Alexandria may have been caused by the Jews being portrayed as misanthropes. Churikover argues that the reason for hatred of Jews in the Hellenistic period was their separateness in the Greek cities, the polis. Bohawk has argued, however, that early animosity against the Jews cannot be regarded as being anti-Judaic or anti-Semitic unless it arose from attitudes that were held against the Jews alone, and that many Greeks showed animosity toward any group they regarded as barbarians. Statements exhibiting prejudice against Jews and their religion can be found in the works of many pagan Greek and Roman writers. Edward Flannery writes that it was the Jews' refusal to accept Greek religious and social standards that marked them out. Hecatitus of Abdera, a Greek historian of the early 3rd century BCE, wrote that Moses in remembrance of the exile of his people, instituted for them a misanthropic and inhospitable way of life. Manetho, an Egyptian historian, wrote that the Jews were expelled Egyptian lepers who had been taught by Moses not to adore the gods. Edward Flannery describes anti-Semitism in ancient times as essentially cultural, 
taking the shape of a national xenophobia played out in political settings. Secular or Racial Anti-Semitism 20th Century 21st Century European Anti-Semitism 21st Century Arab Anti-Semitism Causes Current Situation Africa Algeria Egypt Libya Morocco South Africa Tunisia Asia There are examples of Hellenistic rulers desecrating the temple and banning Jewish religious practices, such as circumcision, Shabbat observance, study of Jewish religious books, etc. Examples may also be found in anti-Jewish riots in Alexandria in the 3rd century BCE. The Jewish diaspora on the Nile island Elephantine, which was founded by mercenaries, experienced the destruction of its temple in 410 BCE. Relationships between the Jewish people and the occupying Roman Empire were at times antagonistic and resulted in several rebellions. According to Suetonius, the emperor Tiberius expelled from Rome Jews who had gone to live there. The 18th century English historian Edward Gibbon identified a more tolerant period in Roman Jewish relations beginning in about 160 CE. However, when Christianity became the state religion of the Roman Empire, the state's attitude towards the Jews gradually worsened. James Carroll asserted, Jews accounted for 10% of the total population of the Roman Empire. By that ratio, if other factors such as pogroms and conversions had not intervened, there would be 200 million Jews in the world today, instead of something like 13 million. In the late 6th century CE, the newly Catholicist Visigothic Kingdom in Hispania issued a series of anti-Jewish edicts which forbade Jews from marrying Christians, practicing circumcision, and observing Jewish holy days. Continuing throughout the 7th century, both Visigothic kings and the Church were active in creating social aggression and towards Jews with civic and ecclesiastic punishments, ranging between forced conversion, slavery, exile, and death. From the 9th century, the medieval Islamic world classified Jews and Christians as Jehimas, and allowed Jews to practice their religion more freely than they could do in medieval Christian Europe. Under Islamic rule, there was a golden age of Jewish culture in Spain that lasted until at least the 11th century. It ended when several Muslim pogroms against Jews took place on the Iberian Peninsula, including those that occurred in Córdoba in 1011 and in Granada in 1066. Several decrees ordering the destruction of synagogues were also enacted in Egypt, Syria, Iraq, and Yemen from the 11th century. In addition, Jews were forced to convert to Islam or face death in some parts of Yemen, Morocco, and Baghdad several times between the 12th and 18th centuries. The Almohads, who had taken control of the Almoravids Makribi and Andalusian territories by 1147, were far more fundamentalist in outlook compared to their predecessors, and they treated the Tehimis harshly. Faced with the choice of either death or conversion, many Jews and Christians emigrated. Some, such as the family of Maimonides, fled east to more tolerant Muslim lands, while some others went northward to settle in the growing Christian kingdoms. During the Middle Ages in Europe there was persecution against Jews in many places, with blood libels, expulsions, forced conversions and massacres. A main justification of prejudice against Jews in Europe was religious. The persecution hit its first peak during the Crusades. 
In the First Crusade hundreds or even thousands of Jews were killed as the Crusaders arrived. This was the first major outbreak of anti-Jewish violence in Christian Europe outside Spain and was cited by Zionists in the 19th century as indicating the need for a state of Israel. In the Second Crusade the Jews in Germany were subject to several massacres. The Jews were also subjected to attacks by the Shepherds Crusades of 1251 and 1320 as well as Rint Fleisch Nights in 1298. The Crusades were followed by expulsions, including, in 1290, the banishing of all English Jews, in 1394, the expulsion of 100,000 Jews in France, and in 1421, the expulsion of thousands from Austria. Many of the expelled Jews fled to Poland. In medieval and Renaissance Europe, a major contributor to the deepening of anti-Semitic sentiment and legal action among the Christian populations was the popular preaching of the zealous Reform religious orders, the Franciscans and Dominicans, who coomed Europe and promoted anti-Semitism through their often fiery, emotional appeals. As the Black Death epidemics devastated Europe in the mid-14th century, causing the death of a large part of the population, Jews were used as scapegoats. Rumors spread that they caused the disease by deliberately poisoning wells. Hundreds of Jewish communities were destroyed in numerous persecutions. Although Pope Clement VI tried to protect them by issuing two papal bulls in 1348, the first on July 6 and an additional one several months later, 900 Jews were burned alive in Strasbourg, where the plague had not yet affected the city. During the mid to late 17th century the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was devastated by several conflicts in which the Commonwealth lost over a third of its population, and Jewish losses were counted in the hundreds of thousands. The first of these conflicts was the Komelnyskaya Uprising, when Baden Komelnyskaya's supporters massacred tens of thousands of Jews in the eastern and southern areas he controlled. The precise number of dead may never be known, but the decrease of the Jewish population during that period is estimated at 100,000 to 200,000, which also includes emigration, deaths from diseases and captivity in the Ottoman Empire, called Jasser. European immigrants to the United States brought anti-Semitism to the country as early as the 17th century. Peter Stuyvesant the Dutch governor of New Amsterdam, implemented plans to prevent Jews from settling in the city. During the colonial era, the American government limited the political and economic rights of Jews. It was not until the American Revolutionary War that Jews gained legal rights, including the right to vote. However, even at their peak, the restrictions on Jews in the United States were never as stringent as they had been in Europe. In the Zaydi Imamate of Yemen, Jews were also singled out for discrimination in the 17th century, which culminated in the general expulsion of all Jews from places in Yemen to the arid coastal plain of Tahama and which became known as the Maza Exile. In 1744, Frederick II of Prussia limited the number of Jews allowed to live in Breslau to only ten so-called protected Jewish families and encouraged a similar practice in other Prussian cities. In 1750 he issued the Revidierts General Privilegium und Reglement vor die Judenskaft, the protected Jews had an alternative to either abstain from marriage or leave Berlin. In the same year, Archduchess of Austria Maria Theresa ordered Jews out of Bohemia but soon reversed her position, on the condition that Jews pay for their readmission every ten years. This extortion was known as Mockgeld. 
In 1752 she introduced the law limiting each Jewish family to one son. In 1782, Joseph II abolished most of these persecution practices in his tolerance patent, on the condition that Yiddish and Hebrew were eliminated from public records and that judicial autonomy was annulled. Moses Mendelssohn wrote that such a tolerance, is even more dangerous play in tolerance than open persecution. Thousands of Jews were slaughtered by Cossack Haidamax in the 1768 massacre of Amman. In 1772, the Empress of Russia Catherine II forced the Jews into the Pale of Settlement and to stay in their shtetls and forbade them from returning to the towns that they occupied before the partition of Poland. From 1804, Jews were banned from their villages, and began to stream into the towns. A decree by Emperor Nicholas I of Russia in 1827 conscripted Jews under 18 years of age into the Cantonist schools for a 25-year military service in order to promote baptism. Policy towards Jews was liberalist somewhat under Tsar Alexander II. However, his assassination in 1881 served as a pretext for further repression such as the May Laws of 1882. Constantin Pobdenostsev, nicknamed the Black Tsar and tutor to the Tsarevich, later crowned Tsar Nicholas II, declared that one-third of the Jews must die, one-third must emigrate, and one-third be converted to Christianity. According to Arnold Ages, Voltaire's Lettres Philosophiques, Dictionnaire Philosophique, and Candide, to name but a few of his better known works, are saturated with comments on Jews and Judaism and the vast majority are negative. Paul H. Meyer adds, There is no question but that Voltaire, particularly in his latter years, nursed a violent hatred of the Jews and it is equally certain that his animosity, did have a considerable impact on public opinion in France. Thirty of the 118 articles in Voltaire's Dictionnaire Philosophique concerned Jews and described them in consistently negative ways. Historian Martin Gilbert writes that it was in the 19th century that the position of Jews worsened in Muslim countries. Benny Morris writes that one symbol of Jewish degradation was the phenomenon of stone throwing at Jews by Muslim children. Morris quotes a 19th century traveler, I have seen a little fellow of six years old, with a troop of fat toddlers of only three and four, teaching to throw stones at a Jew, and one little urchin would, with the greatest coolness, waddle up to the man and literally spit upon his Jewish gabardine. To all this the Jew is obliged to submit, it would be more than his life was worth to offer to strike a Mohammedan. In the middle of the 19th century, J. J. Benjamin wrote about the life of Persian Jews, describing conditions and beliefs that went back to the 16th century, they are obliged to live in a separate part of town. Under the pretext of their being unclean, they are treated with the greatest severity and should they enter a street, inhabited by Muslims, they are pelted by the boys and mobs with stones and dirt. In Jerusalem at least, conditions for some Jews improved. Moses Montefiore, on his seventh visit in 1875, noted that fine new buildings had sprung up and, Surely we're approaching the time to witness God's hallowed promise unto Zion. Muslim and Christian Arabs participated in Purim and Passover, Arabs called the Sephardis Jews, sons of Arabs, the ulama and the rabbis offered joint prayers for rain in time of drought. At the time of the Dreyfus trial in France, Muslim comments usually favored the persecuted Jew against his Christian persecutors.
In 1850 the German composer Richard Wagner who has been called the inventor of modern anti-Semitism published Das Judenthum in der Musik under a pseudonym in the Neue Zeitschrift für Musik. The essay began as an attack on Jewish composers, particularly Wagner's contemporaries, and rivals, Felix Mendelssohn and Giacomo Meyerbeer but expanded to accuse Jews of being a harmful and alien element in German culture, who corrupted morals and were, in fact, parasites incapable of creating truly German art. The crux was the manipulation and control by the Jews of the money economy. According to the present constitution of this world, the Jew in truth is already more than emancipated, he rules, and will rule so long as money remains the power before which all our doings and our dealings lose their force. Although originally published anonymously, when the essay was republished 19 years later, in 1869, the concept of the corrupting Jew had become so widely held that Wagner's name was affixed to it. Anti-Semitism can also be found in many of the Grimm's fairy tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm, published from 1812 to 1857. It is mainly characterized by Jews being the villain of a story, such as in The Good Bargain and The Jew Among Thorns. The middle 19th century saw continued official harassment of the Jews especially in Eastern Europe under Tsarist influence. For example, in 1846, 80 Jews approached the governor in Warsaw to retain the right to wear their traditional dress, but were immediately rebuffed by having their hair and beards forcefully cut, at their own expense. In America, even such influential figures as Walt Whitman tolerated bigotry toward the Jews. During his time as editor of the Brooklyn Eagle, the newspaper published historical sketches casting Jews in a bad light. The Dreyfus Affair was an infamous anti-Semitic event of the late 19th century and early 20th century. Alfred Dreyfus, a Jewish artillery captain in the French army, was accused in 1894 of passing secrets to the Germans. As a result of these charges, Dreyfus was convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment on Devil's Island. The actual spy, Marie Charles Esterhazy, was acquitted. The event caused great uproar among the French, with the public choosing sides on the issue of whether Dreyfus was actually guilty or not. Emile Zola accused the army of corrupting the French justice system. However, general consensus held that Dreyfus was guilty, 80% of the press in France condemned him. This attitude among the majority of the French population reveals the underlying anti-Semitism of the time period. Adolf Stürker, the Lutheran court chaplain to Kaiser Wilhelm I, founded in 1878 an anti-Semitic, anti-liberal political party called the Christian Social Party. This party always remained small, and its support dwindled after Stürker's death, with most of its members eventually joining larger conservative groups such as the German National People's Party. Some scholars view Karl Marx's essay on the Jewish question as anti-Semitic, and argue that he often used anti-Semitic epithets in his published and private writings. These scholars argue that Marx equated Judaism with capitalism in his essay, helping to spread that idea. Some further argue that the essay influenced National Socialist, as well as Soviet and Arab anti-Semites. Marx himself had Jewish ancestry and Albert Lindemann and Chaim Maccabee have suggested that he was embarrassed by it. Others argue that Marx consistently supported Prussian Jewish communities' struggles to achieve equal political rights. 
These scholars argue that on the Jewish question is a critique of Bruno Bauer's arguments that Jews must convert to Christianity before being emancipated, and is more generally a critique of liberal rights discourses and capitalism. Ian Hampshire Monk wrote that this work has been cited as evidence for Marx's supposed anti-Semitism, but only the most superficial reading of it could sustain such an interpretation. David McClellan and Francis Wien argue that readers should interpret on the Jewish question in the deeper context of Marx's debates with Bruno Bauer, author of The Jewish Question, about Jewish emancipation in Germany. Wien says that those critics, who see this as a foretaste of Mein Kampf, overlook one essential point, in spite of the clumsy phraseology and crude stereotyping. The essay was actually written as a defense of the Jews. It was a retort to Bruno Bauer, who had argued that Jews should not be granted full civic rights and freedoms unless they were baptized as Christians. According to McClellan, Marx used the word Judentum colloquially, as meaning commerce, arguing that Germans must be emancipated from the capitalist mode of production, not Judaism or Jews in particular. McClellan concludes that readers should interpret the essay's second half as an extended pun at Bauer's expense. Between 1900 and 1924, approximately 1.75 million Jews migrated to America, the bulk from Eastern Europe. Before 1900 American Jews had always amounted to less than 1% of America's total population, but by 1930 Jews formed about 3.5%. This increase, combined with the upward social mobility of some Jews, contributed to a resurgence of anti-Semitism. In the first half of the 20th century, in the USA, Jews were discriminated against in employment, access to residential and resort areas, membership in clubs and organizations, and in tightened quotas on Jewish enrollment and teaching positions in colleges and universities. The lynching of Leo Frank by a mob of prominent citizens in Marietta, Georgia in 1915 turned the spotlight on anti-Semitism in the United States. The case was also used to build support for the renewal of the Ku Klux Klan which had been inactive since 1870. At the beginning of the 20th century, the Bilas trial in Russia represented incidents of blood libel in Europe. Christians used allegations of Jews killing Christians as a justification for the killing of Jews. Anti-Semitism in America reached its peak during the interwar period. The pioneer automobile manufacturer Henry Ford propagated anti-Semitic ideas in his newspaper The Dearborn Independent. The radio speeches of Father Coughlin in the late 1930s attacked Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal and promoted the notion of a Jewish financial conspiracy. Some prominent politicians shared such views, Louis T. McFadden, chairman of the United States House Committee on Banking and Currency, blamed Jews for Roosevelt's decision to abandon the gold standard, and claimed that in the United States today, the Gentiles have the slips of paper while the Jews have the lawful money. In the early 1940s the aviator Charles Lindbergh and many prominent Americans led the America First Committee in opposing any involvement in the war against fascism. During his July 1936 visit to Germany, Lindbergh wrote letters saying that there was more intelligent leadership in Germany than is generally recognized. The German-American Bund held parades in New York City during the late 1930s, where members wore Nazi uniforms and raised flags featuring swastikas alongside American flags. Sometimes race riots as in Detroit in 1943, targeted Jewish businesses for looting and burning. In Germany, Nazism led Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Party, 
who came to power on January 30, 1933 shortly afterwards instituted repressive legislation which denied the Jews basic civil rights. In 1935, the Nuremberg Laws prohibited sexual relations and marriages between Aryans and Jews as Rassenskanda and stripped all German Jews, even quarter and half Jews, of their citizenship. It instituted a pogrom on the night of 9-10 November 1938, dubbed Kristallnacht, in which Jews were killed, their property destroyed and their synagogues torched. Anti-Semitic laws, agitation, and propaganda were extended to German-occupied Europe in the wake of conquest, often building on local anti-Semitic traditions. In the East the Third Reich forced Jews into ghettos in Warsaw, Krakow, Lvov, Lublin, and Radom. After the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941 a campaign of mass murder, conducted by the Einsatzgruppen, culminated from 1942 to 1945 in systematic genocide, the Holocaust. Eleven million Jews were targeted for extermination by the Nazis, and some six million were eventually killed. Anti-Semitism was commonly used as an instrument for settling personal conflicts in the Soviet Union, starting with the conflict between Joseph Stalin and Leon Trotsky and continuing through numerous conspiracy theories spread by official propaganda. Anti-Semitism in the USSR reached new heights after 1948 during the campaign against the rootless cosmopolitan in which numerous Yiddish-language poets, writers, painters, and sculptors were killed or arrested. This culminated in the so-called Doctor's Plot. Similar anti-Semitic propaganda in Poland resulted in the flight of Polish Jewish survivors from the country. After the war, the Kielce pogrom and the March 1968 events in communist Poland represented further incidents of anti-Semitism in Europe. The anti-Jewish violence in post-war Poland has a common theme of blood libel rumors. Physical assaults against Jews in those countries included beatings, stabbings, and other violence, which increased markedly, sometimes resulting in serious injury and death. A 2015 report by the U.S. State Department on Religious Freedom declared that European anti-Israel sentiment crossed the line into anti-Semitism. This rise in anti-Semitic attacks is associated with both the Muslim anti-Semitism and the rise of far-right political parties as a result of the economic crisis of 2008. This rise in the support for far-right ideas in Western and Eastern Europe has resulted in the increase of anti-Semitic acts, mostly attacks on Jewish memorials, synagogues, and cemeteries but also a number of physical attacks against Jews. In Eastern Europe the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the instability of the new states has brought the rise of nationalist movements and the accusation against Jews for the economic crisis, taking over the local economy and bribing the government alongside with traditional and religious motives for anti-Semitism such as blood libels. Most of the anti-Semitic incidents are against Jewish cemeteries and building. Nevertheless. There were several violent attacks against Jews in Moscow in 2006 when a neo-Nazi stabbed nine people at the Bulls Hebronnaya Synagogue, the failed bomb attack on the same synagogue in 1999, the threats against Jewish pilgrims in Amman, Ukraine and the attack against a menorah by extremist Christian organization in Moldova in 2009. Europeans are concerned about anti-Semitism because, historically, societies with a large degree of anti-Semitism are self-destructive. Furthermore, the Jews of Europe have generally aligned themselves with Europe's democratic elite, a class whose future is uncertain according to the Economist Intelligence Unit. Robert Bernstein, founder of Human Rights Watch 
says that anti-Semitism is deeply ingrained and institutionalized in Arab nations in modern times. In a 2011 survey by the Pew Research Center, all of the Muslim-majority Middle Eastern countries polled held few positive opinions of Jews. In the questionnaire, only 2% of Egyptians, 3% of Lebanese Muslims, and 2% of Jordanians reported having a positive view of Jews. Muslim-majority countries outside the Middle East similarly had few who held positive views of Jews, with 4% of Turks and 9% of Indonesians viewing Jews favorably. According to a 2011 exhibition at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, United States, some of the dialogue from Middle East media and commentators about Jews bear a striking resemblance to Nazi propaganda. According to Joseph Joff of Newsweek, anti-Semitism the real stuff, not just bad-mouthing particular Israeli policies is as much part of Arab life today as the hijab or the hookah. Whereas this darkest of creeds is no longer tolerated in polite society in the West, in the Arab world, Jew hatred remains culturally endemic. Muslim clerics in the Middle East have frequently referred to Jews as descendants of apes and pigs, which are conventional epithets for Jews and Christians. According to Professor Robert Wistrich, director of the Vital Sassoon International Center for the Study of Antisemitism, the calls for the destruction of Israel by Iran or by Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, or the Muslim Brotherhood, represent a contemporary mode of genocidal anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism has been explained in terms of racism, xenophobia, projected guilt, displaced aggression, and the search for a scapegoat. Some explanations assign partial blame to the perception of Jewish people as unsociable. Such a perception may have arisen by many Jews having strictly kept to their own communities, with their own practices and laws. It has also been suggested that parts of anti-Semitism arose from a perception of Jewish people as greedy, and this perception has probably evolved in Europe during medieval times where a large portion of money lending was operated by Jews. Factors contributing to this situation included that Jews were restricted from other professions, while the Christian Church declared for their followers that money lending constituted immoral usury. A March 2008 report by the U.S. State Department found that there was an increase in anti-Semitism across the world, and that both old and new expressions of anti-Semitism persist. A 2012 report by the U.S. Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor also noted a continued global increase in anti-Semitism and found that Holocaust denial and opposition to Israeli policy at times was used to promote or justify blatant anti-Semitism. Almost all Jews in Algeria left upon independence in 1962. Algeria's 140,000 Jews had French citizenship since 1870, and they mainly went to France, with some going to Israel. In Egypt, D.A.R. Al-Fad Hila published a translation of Henry Ford's anti-Semitic treatise, The International Jew, complete with distinctly anti-Semitic imagery on the cover. On May 5, 2001, after Shimon Peres visited Egypt, the Egyptian Al-Akbar Internet paper said that lies and deceit are not foreign to Jews. For this reason, Allah changed their shape and made them into monkeys and pigs. In July 2012, Egypt's Al Nahar channel fooled actors into thinking they were on an Israeli television show and filmed their reactions to being told it was an Israeli television show. In response, some of the actors launched into anti-Semitic rants or dialogue, and many became violent. 
Actress Mayor El Beblai said that Allah did not curse the worm and moth as much as he cursed the Jews while actor Mahmoud Abdel Ghaffar launched into a violent rage and said, You brought me someone who looks like a Jew. I hate the Jews to death after finding out it was a prank. Libya had once one of the oldest Jewish communities in the world, dating back to 300 BCE. Despite the repression of Jews in the late 1930, as a result of the pro-Nazi fascist Italian regime, Jews were third of the population of Libya till 1941. In 1942 the Nazi German troops occupied the Jewish quarter of Benghazi, plundering shops and deporting more than 2,000 Jews across the desert. Sent to work in labor camps, more than one-fifth of this group of Jews perished. A series of pogroms started in November 1945, while more than 140 Jews were killed in Tripoli and most synagogues in the city looted. Upon Libya's independence in 1951, most of the Jewish community emigrated from Libya. After the Suez Crisis in 1956, another series of pogroms forced all but about 100 Jews to flee. When Muammar al-Gaddafi came to power in 1969, all remaining Jewish property was confiscated and all debts to Jews cancelled. Jewish communities, in Islamic times often living in ghettos known as Mela, have existed in Morocco for at least 2,000 years. Intermittent large-scale massacres were accompanied by systematic discrimination through the years. In 1875, 20 Jews were killed by a mob in Demnat, Morocco, elsewhere in Morocco. Jews were attacked and killed in the streets in broad daylight. While the pro-Nazi Vichy regime during World War II passed discriminatory laws against Jews, King Muhammad prevented deportation of Jews to death camps in 1948. Approximately 265,000 Jews lived in Morocco. Between 5,000 and 8,000 live there now. In June 1948, Soon after Israel was established and in the midst of the First Arab-Israeli War, riots against Jews broke out in Ujda and Jarida, killing 44 Jews. In 1948-9, 18,000 Jews left the country for Israel. After this, Jewish emigration continued, but slowed to a few thousand a year. Through the early 50s, Zionist organizations encouraged emigration, particularly in the poorer south of the country, seeing Moroccan Jews as valuable contributors to the Jewish state. In 1955, Morocco attained independence and emigration to Israel has increased further until 1956, then it was prohibited until 1963, then resumed. By 1967, only 60,000 Jews remained in Morocco. The Six-Day War in 1967 led to increased Arab-Jewish tensions worldwide, including Morocco. By 1971, the Jewish population was down to 35,000, however, most of this wave of emigration went to Europe and North America rather than Israel. Anti-Semitism has been present in history of South Africa since Europeans first set foot ashore on the Cape Peninsula. In the years 1652-1795 Jews were not allowed to settle at the Cape. An 1868 Act would sanction religious discrimination. Anti-Semitism reached its apotheosis in the years leading up to World War II. Inspired by the rise of National Socialism in Germany the Asa Uwe Brandweg whose membership accounted for almost 25% of the 1940 Afrikaner population and the National Party faction New Order would champion a more programmatic solution to the Jewish problem. Jews have lived in Tunisia for at least 2,300 years. In the 13th century, 
Jews were expelled from their homes in Kerwa and were ultimately restricted to ghettos, known as Hara. Forced to wear distinctive clothing, several Jews earned high positions in the Tunisian government. Several prominent international traders were Tunisian Jews. From 1855 to 1864, Muhammad Bey relaxed Timai laws, but reinstated them in the face of anti-Jewish riots that continued at least until 1869. Tunisia, as the only Middle Eastern country under direct Nazi control during World War II, was also the site of racist anti-Semitic measures activities such as the Yellow Star, prison camps, deportations, and other persecution. In 1948, approximately 105,000 Jews lived in Tunisia. Only about 1,500 remain there today. Following Tunisia's independence from France in 1956, a number of anti-Jewish policies led to emigration, of which half went to Israel and the other half to France. After attacks in 1967, Jewish emigration both to Israel and France accelerated. There were also attacks in 1982, 1985, and most recently in 2002 when a bomb in Jerba took 21 lives near the local synagogue, in a terrorist attack claimed by Al-Qaeda. Iran Japan Lebanon Malaysia Palestinian Territories Pakistan Saudi Arabia Turkey Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, former president of Iran, has frequently been accused of denying the Holocaust. In July, the winner of Iran's first annual International Wall Street Downfall Cartoon Festival, jointly sponsored by the semi-state-run Iranian media outlet Fars News, was an anti-Semitic cartoon depicting Jews praying before the New York Stock Exchange, which is made to look like the Western Wall. Other cartoons in the contest were anti-Semitic as well. The national director of the Anti-Defamation League, Abraham Foxman, condemned the cartoon, stating that here's the anti-Semitic notion of Jews and their love for money, the canard that Jews control Wall Street and a cynical perversion of the Western Wall, the holiest site in Judaism, and once again Iran takes the prize for promoting anti-Semitism. The Japanese first learned about anti-Semitism in 1918, during the cooperation of the Imperial Japanese Army with the White Movement in Siberia. White Army soldiers had been issued copies of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, and the protocols continue to be used as evidence of Jewish conspiracies even though they are widely acknowledged to be a forgery. During World War II, Nazi Germany encouraged Japan to adopt anti-Semitic policies. In the post-war period, extremist groups and ideologues have promoted conspiracy theories. In 2004, Almana a media network affiliated with Hezbollah, aired a drama series, The Diaspora, which observers allege is based on historical anti-Semitic allegations. BBC correspondents who have watched the program says it quotes extensively from the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Although Malaysia presently has no substantial Jewish population, the country has reportedly become an example of a phenomenon called anti-Semitism without Jews. In his treatise on Malay identity, The Malay Dilemma, which was published in 1970, former Malaysian Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad wrote, The Jews are not only hook-nosed, but understand money instinctively. Jewish stinginess and financial wizardry gained them the economic control of Europe and provoked anti-Semitism which waxed and waned throughout Europe through the ages. 
the Malay language Yudas in Malaysia Daily stated in an editorial that Malaysians cannot allow anyone, especially the Jews, to interfere secretly in this country's business. When the drums are pounded hard in the name of human rights, the pro-Jewish people will have their best opportunity to interfere in any Islamic country, the newspaper said. We might not realize that the enthusiasm to support actions such as demonstrations will cause us to help foreign groups succeed in their mission of controlling this country. Prime Minister Najib Razak's office subsequently issued a statement late Monday saying Yudison's claim did not reflect the views of the government. In March 2011, the Israeli government issued a paper claiming that anti-Israel and anti-Semitic messages are heard regularly in the government and private media and in the mosques and are taught in school books, to the extent that they are an integral part of the fabric of life inside the PA. In August 2012, Israeli Strategic Affairs Ministry Director General Yossi Kuper Wasser stated that Palestinian incitement to anti Semitism is going on all the time and that it is worrying and disturbing. At an institutional level, he said the PA has been promoting three key messages to the Palestinian people that constitute incitement that the Palestinians would eventually be the sole sovereign on all the land from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea that Jews, especially those who live in Israel, were not really human beings but rather the scum of mankind, and that all tools were legitimate in the struggle against Israel and the Jews. In August 2014, the Hamas spokesman in Doha said on live television that Jews use blood to make matzos. The U.S. State Department's first report on global anti-Semitism mentioned a strong feeling of anti-Semitism in Pakistan. In Pakistan, a country without Jewish communities, anti-Semitic sentiment fanned by anti-Semitic articles in the press is widespread. In Pakistan, Jews are often regarded as miserly. After Israel's independence in 1948, violent incidents occurred against Pakistan's small Jewish community of about 2,000 Baini Israel Jews. The Magain Shalom Synagogue in Karachi was attacked, as were individual Jews. The persecution of Jews resulted in their exodus via India to Israel, the UK, Canada, and other countries. The Peshawar Jewish community ceased to exist although a small community reportedly still exists in Karachi. A substantial number of people in Pakistan believe that the September 11 attacks on the World Trade Center in New York were a secret Jewish conspiracy organized by Israel's Mossad, as were the July 7, 2005 London bombings, allegedly perpetrated by Jews in order to discredit Muslims. Pakistani political commentator Zaid Hamid claimed that Indian Jews perpetrated the 2008 Mumbai attacks. Such allegations echo traditional anti-Semitic theories. The Jewish religious movement of Habad Lubavak had a mission house in Mumbai, India that was attacked in the 2008 Mumbai attacks, perpetrated by militants connected to Pakistan led by Ajmal Kazab a Pakistani national. Anti-Semitic intents were evident from the testimonies of Kazab following his arrest and trial. Saudi textbooks vilify Jews, call Jews apes, demand that students avoid and not befriend Jews, claim that Jews worship the devil, and encourage Muslims to engage in jihad to vanquish Jews. Saudi Arabian government officials and state religious leaders often promote the idea that Jews are conspiring to take over the entire world, as proof of their claims they publish and frequently cite the Protocols of the Elders of Zion as factual. In 2004, the official Saudi Arabia tourism website said that Jews and holders of Israeli passports would not be issued visas to enter the country. After an uproar, 
the restriction against Jews was removed from the website although the ban against Israeli passport holders remained. In late 2014, a Saudi newspaper reported that foreign workers of most religions, including Judaism, were welcome in the kingdom, but Israeli citizens were not. In 2003, the Neve Shalom synagogue was targeted in a car bombing, killing 21 Turkish Muslims and six Jews. In June 2011, the Economist suggested that the best way for Turks to promote democracy would be to vote against the ruling party. Not long after, the Turkish Prime Minister, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, said that the international media, as they are supported by Israel, would not be happy with the continuation of the AKP government. The Hurriyet Daily News quoted Erdogan at the time as claiming The Economist is part of an Israeli conspiracy that aims to topple the Turkish government. Moreover, during Erdogan's tenure, Hitler's main camp has once again become a best-selling book in Turkey. Prime Minister Erdogan called anti-Semitism a crime against humanity. He also said that as a minority, there are citizens. Both their security and the right to observe their faith are under our guarantee. According to a 2004 report from the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, anti-Semitism had increased significantly in Europe since 2000, with significant increases in verbal attacks against Jews and vandalism such as graffiti, fire bombings of Jewish schools, desecration of synagogues and cemeteries. Germany, France, Britain, and Russia are the countries with the highest rate of anti-Semitic incidents in Europe. The Netherlands and Sweden have also consistently had high rates of anti-Semitic attacks since 2000. Some claim that recent European anti-Semitic violence can actually be seen as a spillover from the long-running Arab-Israeli conflict since the majority of the perpetrators are from the large Muslim immigrant communities in European cities. However, compared to France, the United Kingdom and much of the rest of Europe, in Germany Arab and pro-Palestinian groups are involved in only a small percentage of anti-Semitic incidents. According to the Stephen Roth Institute for the Study of Contemporary Anti-Semitism and Racism, most of the more extreme attacks on Jewish sites and physical attacks on Jews in Europe come from militant Islamic and Muslim groups, and most Jews tend to be assaulted in countries where groups of young Muslim immigrants reside. On January 1, 2006, Britain's chief rabbi, Lord Jonathan Sachs, warned that what he called a tsunami of anti-Semitism was spreading globally. In an interview with BBC Radio 4, Sachs said, A number of my rabbinical colleagues throughout Europe have been assaulted and attacked on the streets. We've had synagogues desecrated. We've had Jewish schools burnt to the ground not here but in France. People are attempting to silence and even ban Jewish societies on campuses on the grounds that Jews must support the State of Israel, therefore they should be banned, which is quite extraordinary because British Jews see themselves as British citizens. So it's that kind of feeling that you don't know what's going to happen next that's making some European Jewish communities uncomfortable. Following an escalation in anti-Semitism in 2012, which included the deadly shooting of three children at a Jewish school in France, the European Jewish Congress demanded in July a more proactive response. EJC President Moshe Cantor explained, We call on authorities to take a more proactive approach so there would be no reason for statements of regret and denunciation. All these smaller attacks remind me of smaller tremors before a massive earthquake. The Jewish community cannot afford to be subject to an earthquake and the authorities cannot say that the writing was not on the wall.
He added that European countries should take legislative efforts to ban any form of incitement, as well as to equip the authorities with the necessary tools to confront any attempt to expand terrorist and violent activities against Jewish communities in Europe. France is home to the continent's largest Jewish community. Jewish leaders decry an intensifying anti-Semitism in France mainly among Muslims of Arab or African heritage, but also growing among Caribbean Icelanders from former French colonies. Former Interior Minister Nicolas Sarkozy denounced the killing of Ilan Halimi on February 13, 2006 as an anti-Semitic crime. Jewish philanthropist Baron Eric de Rothschild suggests that the extent of anti-Semitism in France has been exaggerated. In an interview with the Jerusalem Post he says that the one thing you can't say is that France is an anti-Semitic country. In March 2012, Mohamed Mara opened fire at a Jewish school in Toulouse, killing a teacher and three children. An eight-year-old girl was shot in the head at point-blank range. President Nicolas Sarkozy said that it was obvious it was an anti-Semitic attack and that, I want to say to all the leaders of the Jewish community, how close we feel to them. All of France is by their side. The Israeli Prime Minister condemned the despicable anti-Semitic murders. After a 32-hour siege and standoff with the police outside his house, in a French raid, Marat jumped off a balcony and was shot in the head and killed. Marat told police during the standoff that he intended to keep on attacking, and he loved death the way the police loved life. He also claimed connections with Al-Qaeda. Four months later, in July 2012, a French Jewish teenager wearing a distinctive religious symbol was the victim of a violent anti-Semitic attack on a train traveling between Toulouse and Lyon. The teen was first verbally harassed and later beaten up by two assailants. Richard Praskier from the French Jewish Umbrella Group, CRIF, called the attack another development in the worrying trend of anti-Semitism in our country. Another incident in July 2012 dealt with the vandalism of the synagogue of noisy le ground of the Saint-Saint-Denis district in Paris. The synagogue was vandalized three times in a ten-day period. Prayer books and shawls were thrown on the floor, windows were shattered, drawers were ransacked, and walls, tables, clocks, and floors were vandalized. The authorities were alerted of the incidents by the Bureau National de Vigilance contre l'Antisemitisme, a French anti-Semitism watchdog group which called for more measures to be taken to prevent future hate crimes. NVCA President Sami Ghazlan stated that, despite the measures taken, things persist, and I think that we need additional legislation, because the Jewish community is annoyed. In August 2012, Abraham Cooper, the dean of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, met French Interior Minister Manuel Valls and reported that anti-Semitic attacks against French Jews increased by 40% since Marat's shooting spree in Toulouse. Cooper pressed Valls to take extra measures to secure the safety of French Jews, as well as to discuss strategies to foil an increasing trend of lone wolf terrorists on the Internet. Wolfgang Schauble the Interior Minister of Germany in 2006, pointed out the official policy of Germany, we will not tolerate any form of extremism, xenophobia, or anti-Semitism. Although the number of extreme right-wing groups and organizations grew from 141 to 182, especially in the formerly communist East Germany, Germany's measures against right-wing groups and anti-Semitism are effective, despite Germany having the highest rates of anti-Semitic acts in Europe.
According to the annual reports of the Federal Office for the Protection of the Constitution the overall number of far-right extremists in Germany dropped during the last years from 49,700, 45,000, 41,500, 40,700, 39,000, to 38,600 in 2006. Germany provided several million euros to fund nationwide programs aimed at fighting far-right extremism, including teams of traveling consultants, and victims' groups. In July 2012, two women were assaulted in Germany, sprayed with tear gas, and were shown a Hitler salute, apparently because of a Star of David necklace that they wore. In late August 2012, Berlin police investigated an attack on a 53-year-old rabbi and his six-year-old daughter, allegedly by four Arab teens, after which the rabbi needed treatment for head wounds at a hospital. The police classified the attack as a hate crime. Judisk Algemeine reported that the rabbi was wearing a kippah and was approached by one of the teens who asked the rabbi if he was Jewish. The teen then attacked the rabbi while yelling anti-Semitic comments, and threatened to kill the rabbi's daughter. Berlin's mayor condemned the attack, saying that Berlin is an international city in which intolerance, xenophobia and anti-Semitism are not being tolerated. Police will undertake all efforts to find and arrest the perpetrators. In October 2012, various historians, including Dr. Julius H. Schopes, a prominent German Jewish historian and a member of the German Interior Ministry's Commission to Combat Anti Semitism, charged the majority of Bundestag deputies with failing to understand anti Semitism and the imperativeness of periodic legislative reports on German anti Semitism. Schopes cited various anti-Semitic statements by German parliament members as well. The report in question determined that 15% of Germans are anti-Semitic while over 20% espouse latent anti-Semitism, but the report has been criticized for downplaying the sharpness of anti-Semitism in Germany, as well as for failing to examine anti-Israel media coverage in Germany. Anti-Semitism in Greece manifests itself in religious, political, and media discourse. The recent Greek government debt crisis has facilitated the rise of far-right groups in Greece, most notably the formerly obscure Golden Dawn. Jews have lived in Greece since antiquity, but the largest community of around 20,000 Sephardic Jews settled in Thessalonica after an invitation from the Ottoman Sultan in the 15th century. After Thessalonica was annexed to Greece in 1913, the Greek government recognized Jews as Greek citizens with full rights and attributed Judaism the status of a recognized and protected religion. Currently in Greece, Jewish communities representing the 5,000 Greek Jews are legal entities under public law. According to the ADL report of 2015, the ADL Global 100, a report of the status of anti-Semitism in 100 countries around the world, 69% of the adult population in Greece harbor anti-Semitic attitudes and 85% think that Jews have too much power in the business world. In March 2015, a survey about the Greeks' perceptions of the Holocaust was published. Its findings showed that less than 60% of the respondents think that Holocaust teaching should be included in the curriculum. In the 21st century, anti-Semitism in Hungary has evolved and received an institutional framework, while verbal and physical aggression against Jews has escalated, creating a great difference between its earlier manifestations in the 1990s and recent developments. One of the major representatives of this institutionalized anti-Semitic ideology is the popular Hungarian party Jobbik 
which received 17% of the vote in the April 2010 national election. The far-right subculture, which ranges from nationalist shops to radical nationalist and neo-Nazi festivals and events, plays a major role in the institutionalization of Hungarian anti-Semitism in the 21st century. The contemporary anti-Semitic rhetoric has been updated and expanded, but is still based on the old anti-Semitic notions. The traditional accusations and motifs include such phrases as Jewish occupation, international Jewish conspiracy, Jewish responsibility for the Treaty of Trianon, Judeo-Bolshevism, as well as blood libels against Jews. Nevertheless, the past few years have seen the re-emergence of the blood libel and an increase in Holocaust relativization and denial, while the monetary crisis has revived references to the Jewish banker class. The ongoing political conflict between Israel and Palestine has played an important role in the development and expression of anti-Semitism in the 21st century, and in Italy as well. The Second Intifada, which began in late September 2000, has set in motion unexpected mechanisms, whereby traditional anti-Jewish prejudices were mixed with politically based stereotypes. In this belief system, Israeli Jews were charged with full responsibility for the fate of the peace process and with the conflict presented as embodying the struggle between good and evil. The Netherlands has the second highest incidence of anti-Semitic incidents in the European Union. However, it is difficult to obtain exact figures because the specific groups against whom attacks are made are not specifically identified in police reports, and analyses of police data for anti-Semitism therefore relies on keyword searches, e.g. Jew or Israel. According to Center for Information and Documentation on Israel, a pro-Israel lobby group in the Netherlands, the number of anti-Semitic incidents reported in the whole of the Netherlands was 108 in 2008, 93 in 2009, and 124 in 2010. Some two-thirds of this are acts of aggression. There are approximately 52,000 Dutch Jews. According to the NRC Handelsblad newspaper, the number of anti-Semitic incidents in Amsterdam was 14 in 2008 and 30 in 2009. In 2010, Raphael Evers, an Orthodox rabbi in Amsterdam, told the Norwegian newspaper Aftenposten that Jews can no longer be safe in the city anymore due to the risk of violent assaults. We Jews no longer feel at home here in the Netherlands. Many people talk about moving to Israel, he said. According to the Anne Frank Foundation, anti-Semitism in the Netherlands in 2011 was roughly at the same level as in 2010. Actual anti-Semitic incidents increased from 19 in 2010 to 30 in 2011. Verbal anti-Semitic incidents dropped slightly from 1,173 in 2010 to 1,098 in 2011. This accounts for 75%-80% of all verbal racist incidents in the Netherlands. Anti-Semitism is more prevalent in the age group 23-27 years, which is a younger group than that of racist incidents in general. In 2010, the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation after one year of research, revealed that anti-Semitism was common among some 8th, 9th and 10th graders in Oslo's schools. Teachers at schools with large numbers of Muslims revealed that Muslim students often praise or admire Adolf Hitler for his killing of Jews, that Jew hate is legitimate within vast groups of Muslim students and that Muslims laugh or command to stop when trying to educate about the Holocaust. Additionally, while some students might protest when some express support for terrorism, none object when students express hate of Jews, 
saying that it says in the Quran that you shall kill Jews, all true Muslims hate Jews. Most of these students were said to be born and raised in Norway. One Jewish father also stated that his child had been taken by a Muslim mob after school, reportedly to be taken out to the forest and hung because he was a Jew. Norwegian Education Minister Kristen Halvorsen referred to the anti-Semitism reported in this study as being completely unacceptable. The head of a local Islamic council joined Jewish leaders and Halvorsen in denouncing such anti-Semitism. In October 2012, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe issued a report regarding anti-Semitism in Norway, criticizing Norway for an increase in anti-Semitism in the country and blaming Norwegian officials for failing to address anti-Semitism. The University of Warsaw's study in 2016 found that 37% of surveyed polls expressed negative attitudes towards Jews, 56% said that they wouldn't accept a Jew in their family, and 32% wouldn't want Jewish neighbors. In November 2015, following Antoni Macierwa's designation as Minister of National Defense, he faced allegations of anti-Semitism and protests by the Anti-Defamation League. Anti-Semitism in Russia refers to acts of hostility against Jews in Russia and the promotion of anti-Semitic views in the country since the end of the Soviet Union. Europe Austria France Germany Greece Hungary, Italy, Netherlands, Norway, Poland, Russia, Spain, Sweden, Ukraine, United Kingdom, North America, Canada, United States. South America Venezuela After Germany and Austria, Sweden has the highest rate of anti-Semitic incidents in Europe, though the Netherlands has reported a higher rate of anti-Semitism in some years. A government study in 2006 estimated that 15% of Swedes agree with the statement, the Jews have too much influence in the world today. 5% of the total adult population and 39% of adult Muslims harbor systematic anti-Semitic views. The former Prime Minister Goran Persson described these results as surprising and terrifying. However, the rabbi of Stockholm's Orthodox Jewish community, Meir Horden, said that it's not true to say that the Swedes are anti-Semitic. Some of them are hostile to Israel because they support the weak side, which they perceive the Palestinians to be. In 2009, a synagogue that served the Jewish community in Malmo was set ablaze. Jewish cemeteries were repeatedly desecrated, worshippers were abused while returning home from prayer, and masked men mockingly chanted Hitler in the streets. As a result of security concerns, Malmö's synagogue has guards and rocket-proof glass in the windows, and the Jewish kindergarten can only be reached through thick steel security doors. In early 2010, the Swedish publication The Local published series of articles about the growing anti-Semitism in Malmö, Sweden. In 2009, the Malmo police received reports of 79 anti-Semitic incidents, which was twice the number of the previous year. Frederick Sieridsky, spokesman for the Malmo Jewish community, estimated that the already small Jewish population is shrinking by 5% a year. Malmo is a place to move away from, he said, citing anti-Semitism as the primary reason. In March 2010, Frederick Sieridsky told Die Press, an Austrian internet publication, 
that Jews are being harassed and physically attacked by people from the Middle East, although he added that only a small number of Malmo's 40,000 Muslims exhibit hatred of Jews. In October 2010, the Forward reported on the current state of Jews and the level of anti-Semitism in Sweden. Henrik Bachner, a writer and professor of history at the University of Lund, claimed that members of the Swedish parliament have attended anti-Israel rallies where the Israeli flag was burned while the flags of Hamas and Hezbollah were waved, and the rhetoric was often anti-Semitic not just anti-Israel. Judith Popinski, an 86-year-old Holocaust survivor, stated that she is no longer invited to schools that have a large Muslim presence to tell her story of surviving the Holocaust. In December 2010, the Jewish human rights organization Simon Wiesenthal Center issued a travel advisory concerning Sweden, advising Jews to express extreme caution when visiting the southern parts of the country due to an alleged increase in verbal and physical harassment of Jewish citizens in the city of Malmö. Ilmer Ripalu, the mayor of Malmö for over 15 years, has been accused of failing to protect the Jewish community in Malmö, causing 30 Jewish families to leave the city in 2010, and more preparing to leave which has left the possibility that Malmo's Jewish community will disappear soon. Critics of Ripolo say that his statements, such as anti-Semitism in Malmo actually being an understandable consequence of Israeli policy in the Middle East, have encouraged young Muslims to abuse and harass the Jewish community. In an interview with the Sunday Telegraph in February 2010, Ripolo said, there haven't been any attacks on Jewish people, and if Jews from the city want to move to Israel that is not a matter for Malmo, which renewed concerns about Ripalu. Oli Tyanabak, the leader of the far-right Svoboda party, whose members hold senior positions in Ukraine's government, urged his party to fight the Moscow Jewish Mafia ruling Ukraine. The Aljmeiner Journal reported, Svoboda supporters include among their heroes leaders of pro-Nazi World War II organizations known for their atrocities against Jews and Poles, such as the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, the Ukrainian Insurgent Army, and the 14th Waffen-SS Galicia Division. According to the Simon Wiesenthal Center Ukraine has, to the best of our knowledge, never conducted a single investigation of a local Nazi war criminal, let alone prosecuted a Holocaust perpetrator. According to Der Spiegel, Dmitro Yerush, leader of the far-right right sector, wrote, I wonder how it came to pass that most of the billionaires in Ukraine are Jews. Late February 2014 Yerish pledged during a meeting with Israel's ambassador in Kiev to fight all forms of racism. Right sector's leader for West Ukraine, Alexandra Musikko, has talked about fighting communists, Jews and Russians for as long as blood flows in my veins. Musikko was shot dead on March 24, 2014. An official inquiry concluded he had shot himself in the heart at the end of a chase with the Ukrainian police. In April 2014, Donetsk chief Rabbi Pinchas Vyshitsky said that anti-Semitic incidents in the Russian-speaking East were rare, unlike in Kiev and western Ukraine. In an April 2014 article about anti-Jewish violence in Ukraine in Haaretz no incidents outside this Russian-speaking East were mentioned. According to the Israel's ambassador to Ukraine, the anti-Semitism occurs here much less frequently than in other European countries, and has more a hooligan's nature rather than a system. In 2017 a Institute for Jewish Policy Research survey found that the levels of anti-Semitism in Great Britain were among the lowest in the world, with 2.4% expressing multiple anti-Semitic attitudes, 
and about 70% having a favorable opinion of Jews. However, only 17% had a favorable opinion of Israel, with 33% holding an unfavorable view. In 2017, a report by the Campaign Against Antisemitism found that the previous year, 2016, had been the worst on record for antisemitic hate crime in the UK. Prior to that, 2015 had been the worst year on record, and 2014 was the worst year on record before that. The report found that in 2016, antisemitic crime rose by 15% compared to 2015, or 45% compared to 2014. It also found that 1 in 10 antisemitic crimes was violent. Despite rising levels of antisemitic crime, the report said there had been a decrease in the charging of antisemitic crime. In the report's foreword, the CAA's chairman wrote, Britain has the political will to fight antisemitism and strong laws with which to do it but those responsible for tackling the rapidly growing racist targeting of British Jews are failing to enforce the law. There is a very real danger of Jewish citizens emigrating, as has happened elsewhere in Europe unless there is radical change. Every year since 2015, the CAA has commissioned polling by YouGov concerning the attitude of the British public toward British Jews. In 2017, their polling found that 36% of British adults believed at least one of the anti-Semitic statements pollsters had shown them to be true, a reduction from 39% in 2016 and 45% in 2015. Additionally, the polling revealed widespread fear amongst British Jews with almost one in three saying that they had considered emigrating in the last two years due to anti-Semitism, and 37% saying that they concealed their Judaism in public. The report gave various indications as to the cause of the fears, with British Jews identifying Islamist anti-Semitism, far-left anti-Semitism and far-right anti-Semitism as their main concerns, in that order. 78% of British Jews saying that they had witnessed anti-Semitism disguised as a political comment about Israel, 76% thoughts that political developments were contributing anti-Semitism, and 52% felt that the Crown Prosecution Service was not doing enough. In 2016, the Home Affairs Select Committee held an inquiry into the rise of anti-Semitism in the UK. The inquiry called David Cameron, Tim Farron, Angus Robertson, Jeremy Corbyn, Ken Livingstone, and others to give evidence. In 2005, a group of British members of Parliament set up an inquiry into anti-Semitism, which published its findings in 2006. Its report stated that until recently, the prevailing opinion both within the Jewish community and beyond that anti-Semitism had receded to the point that it existed only on the margins of society. It found a reversal of this progress since 2000. The inquiry was reconstituted following a surge in anti-Semitic incidents in Britain during the summer of 2014, and the new inquiry published its report in 2015 making recommendations for reducing anti-Semitism. Although anti-Semitism in Canada is less prevalent than in many other countries, there have been recent incidents. For example, a 2004 study identified 24 incidents of anti-Semitism between March 14 and July 14, 2004 in Newfoundland, Montreal, Quebec City, Ottawa, the Greater Toronto Area, and some smaller Ontario communities. The incidents included vandalism and other attacks on four synagogues, six cemeteries, four schools, and a number of businesses and private residences. In November 2005, 
the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights examined anti-Semitism on college campuses. It reported that incidents of threatened bodily injury, physical intimidation, or property damage are now rare, but anti-Semitism still occurs on many campuses and is a serious problem. The Commission recommended that the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights protect college students from anti-Semitism through vigorous enforcement of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and further recommended that Congress clarify that Title VI applies to discrimination against Jewish students. On September 19, 2006, Yale University founded the Yale Initiative for the Interdisciplinary Study of Antisemitism, the first North American university-based center for study of the subject, as part of its Institution for Social and Policy Studies. Director Charles Small of the center cited the increase in antisemitism worldwide in recent years as generating a need to understand the current manifestation of this disease. In June 2011, Yale voted to close this initiative. After carrying out a routine review, the faculty review committee said that the initiative had not met its research and teaching standards. Donald Green, then head of Yale's Institution for Social and Policy Studies, the body under whose aegis the anti-Semitism initiative was run, said that it had not had many papers published in the relevant leading journals or attracted many students. As with other programs that had been in a similar situation, the initiative had therefore been cancelled. This decision has been criticized by figures such as former U.S. Commission on Civil Rights Staff Director Kenneth L. Marcus, who is now the director of the Initiative to Combat Anti-Semitism and Anti-Israelism in America's Educational Systems at the Institute for Jewish and Community Research, and Deborah Lipstadt, who described the decision as weird and strange. Anthony Lehrman has supported Yale's decision, describing the YISA as a politicized initiative that was devoted to the promotion of Israel rather than to serious research on anti-Semitism. A 2007 survey by the Anti-Defamation League concluded that 15% of Americans hold anti-Semitic views, which was in line with the average of the previous 10 years, but a decline from the 29% of the early 60s. The survey concluded that education was a strong predictor, with most educated Americans being remarkably free of prejudicial views. The belief that Jews have too much power was considered a common anti-Semitic view by the ADL. Other views indicating anti-Semitism, according to the survey, include the view that Jews are more loyal to Israel than America, and that they are responsible for the death of Jesus of Nazareth. The survey found that anti-Semitic Americans are likely to be intolerant generally, e.g. regarding immigration and free speech. The 2007 survey also found that 29% of foreign-born Hispanics and 32% of African Americans hold strong anti-Semitic beliefs, three times more than the 10% for whites. A 2009 study published in Boston Review found that nearly 25% of non-Jewish Americans blamed Jews for the financial crisis of 2008-2009 with a higher percentage among Democrats than Republicans. 32% of Democrats blamed Jews for the financial crisis, versus 18% for Republicans. In August 2012, the California State Assembly approved a non-binding resolution that encourages university leaders to combat a wide array of anti-Jewish and anti-Israel actions although the resolution is purely symbolic and does not carry policy implications. In April 2017, Politico magazine published an article purporting to show links between U.S. President Donald Trump, Russian President Vladimir Putin and the Jewish outreach organization Chabad Lubavitch. The article was widely condemned, 
with the head of the Anti-Defamation League Jonathan Greenblatt saying that it evokes age-old myths about Jews. In November 2017, Jonathan Greenblatt, National Director and CEO of the Anti-Defamation League, stated in an interview, while anti-Semitic attitudes have remained consistent at 14%, anti-Semitic incidents have been on the rise. In 2016 we saw a 34% increase over the prior year in acts of harassment, vandalism, or violence directed at Jewish individuals and institutions. During the first three quarters of 2017, there was a 67% increase over the same period in 2016. We've seen double the number of incidents in K-12 schools, and almost a 60% increase on college campuses. In a 2009 news story, Michael Rowan and Douglas E. Shearn wrote, in an infamous Christmas Eve speech several years ago, Chavez said the Jews killed Christ and have been gobbling up wealth and causing poverty and injustice worldwide ever since. Hugo Chavez stated that he world is for all of us, then, but it so happens that a minority, the descendants of the same ones that crucified Christ, the descendants of the same ones that kicked Bolivar out of here and also crucified him in their own way over there in Santa Marta, in Colombia. A minority has taken possession of all of the wealth of the world. In February 2012, opposition candidate for the 2012 Venezuelan presidential election Enrique Caprols was subject to what foreign journalists characterized as vicious attacks by state-run media sources. The Wall Street Journal said that Caprols was vilified in a campaign in Venezuela's state-run media which insinuated he was, among other things, a homosexual and a Zionist agent. A February 13, 2012 opinion article in the state-owned Radio Nacional de Venezuela, titled The Enemy is Zionism attacked Capral's Jewish ancestry and linked him with Jewish national groups because of a meeting he had held with local Jewish leaders, saying, This is our enemy the Zionism that Caprols today represents. Zionism, along with capitalism, are responsible for 90% of world poverty and imperialist wars. Notes Bibliography Further reading